our God is amazing. On every level, in every way, he simply is amazing. Everything about him is beyond words. His wisdom, his patience, his generosity, his merciful love toward us. Allow the peace of his presence enter your hearts right now. The very thought that he is your God who cares for you and he is with you at that very moment when you listen to this talk. Allow this peace of his presence to fill your heart. He is the one worth of all the glory and praise. Still, he shares his glory with us. And he is the savior of the whole world. Still, he gives us a share in his amazing work of salvation. Our lives truly are meaningful. And we are created with a purpose, with a mission. We are not just a number in his book of life. We have stories, faces, we have our importance, we have our place in his beautiful mosaic that he's creating throughout the history of the mankind. One day, from the other side of eternity, when we see the whole world and its history from God's perspective, we will be simply in awe. And we will see the importance of our place in that masterpiece. I really like that here in this church we are surrounded by mosaics and they have hundreds, thousands of those little pieces. And if one piece is missing, you immediately spot it. There's this dark hole there, there's this one piece missing. Even though you don't have to be this golden piece, this golden tile, you might be this just one great piece of a little stone, but still you have your importance. And if you are not there, there is a black hole, something is missing in this beautiful masterpiece. Your story is important, you are important, and you have a mission. So much love and wisdom in God's guidance and the way he, he leads us throughout our personal history and the history of the whole world. Last time I shared with you the story of Sister Faustina and the importance the, of her life in the Divine Mercy message how God arranged everything perfectly with her and how he entrusted her this important role of receiving the Divine Mercy message. She was the first recipient of it. But then there were many who followed. She played a pivotal role in bringing to the world the Divine Mercy message, the message of great hope. Jesus said to her once, I am sending you with my mercy to the people of the whole world. I do not want to punish aching mankind, but I desire to heal it, pressing it to my merciful heart. How much compassion is there? He knows we are aching mankind. He knows we need healing. And he sends Faustina with this message to the world that he is the healer. He can heal us. He can heal all the wounds you have in your heart, in your life, in your story. The fundamental goal of the Divine Mercy message uh, was to turn people's hearts and minds to the mystery of God's mercy for all. Divine Mercy message has 
the face of Jesus Christ. When you look at the image of merciful Jesus and you spend time contemplating his face, even without words, it gives you a lot of understanding of what is the divine mercy message really about. It has the price of his wounds which are visible on the image, on his hands, his feet, his pierced heart. It has the price of his blood. And this message is this powerful reminder of God's unshaken, unconditional, tender and compassionate love toward all sinners who, if they only trust him, can become great saints. Who wouldn't want that? It is truly a message of great hope for all. In the previous talk, check um, the recording entitled The Amazing Story Continues, Part 1, or Saint Faustina and the Message. In that talk, I shared with you the events from Sister Faustina's life, which I find most important for you to understand how God was conveying the Divine Mercy message through her life. We ended up telling the story until the year 1938. So let's continue from there. In the summer of 1938, young Karol Wojtyła, I hope you know whom I'm talking about, Young Karol, after graduating from secondary school, moved with his father to Kraków, the beautiful city of kings, um, which was Poland's capital for almost 600 years. I really hope one day you can go and visit. It's really worth it. So in the fall of 1938, he started studying Polish literature at the philosophy department at the Jagiellonian University, the oldest and most noble university we have. So Karol's adult, very promising life was just beginning. At the same time, Sister Faustina's life was at its twilight. At the age of only 33, she was ready to move to the other side of eternity. And she was at peace, even though she knew she didn't, in a sense, that she didn't fulfill her mission. I mean, Jesus entrusted her many tasks concerning the Divine Mercy message. And she couldn't fulfill them all. And at that stage of her life, she was already bedridden with very serious tuberculosis. And she felt there is not much time left. Still, she was really at peace. She wrote a few times on the pages of her diary that she had the deep certainty that her mission would not come to an end upon her death. Quite contrary, it would only begin. Wow, I wish we would all have this perspective and this thinking about our lives. We live for eternity. And yes, the earthly stage finishes, finishes at some point, but... The heavenly one, hopefully the heavenly one, for each and every one of us, that we will choose heaven. It lasts forever. So, Sister Faustina was at peace, knowing, okay, I did my part, the Lord is calling me home. But there was a need of other messengers, of people who would take, take over the mission, and there was, most of all, a need for someone very powerful, someone wholeheartedly dedicated to this mission. And that someone was already being prepared by God to take over Sister Faustina's mission. This young man had no idea about that yet, 
but he was being prepared. Throughout the history of Christianity, all people entrusted with important missions are prepared through intense purifications, through suffering. I shared a bit, a bit with you in the previous talk of what was happening with St. Faustina in her life, how she was being purified, prepared for the mission, also at a very young age, the same as Karol Wojtyła. And now let's, let's see how was it in his life. He was definitely tested like gold in the furnace through life sufferings from a very young age. His older sister, Olga, died only 16 hours after birth. His mother, Emilia, died when Karol was nine years old. His older bro brother, Edmond, died when Karol was 12 years old. And only nine years later, in 1941, when Karol was 21, his father died also. Karol was left completely on his own. The magnitude of the losses is just unspeakable. But when you add to all of these deaths, to losing the whole family in a short period of time, when you add to it the fact that his father dies during the Second World War, that Karol is left alone during Nazi occupation, the suffering increases tremendously. Karol was facing the drama of his times alone, but not alone. I mean, we know that he was not alone because we believe God is always with us, but in the times of suffering, there are so many people who just lose this awareness and they turn their back on God. And that was the risk God took with Karol too. He knew I'm risking Carol's relationship, Carol's friendship with me. Maybe at that stage of his life he will say no to me. Because that was one painful experience too much. But luckily, all those sufferings only brought Carol closer to God's heart. And one year after his father's death, Carol entered seminary. It was 1942. But let's go back to 1938, the year when I started the, the story. I started the story in this talk. So Karol moved with his father to Krakow. That was summer, beautiful summer in the city of Kings. And Sister Faustina died the same year in the fall. So from summer to fall, there are a few months. So theoretically, they could have met. They lived in the same city. And actually, the, the apartment where Karol lived was within close physical proximity from the convent where Faustina lived. Unfortunately, they never met, never physically but spiritual, spiritually, very much so, they really became very close, spiritually. Only three years after Sister Faustina's death, Carol stopped for the first time by her convent to pray. It was 1941 when he started working in the Solvay factory, which was only Jutberetem, or as you say in English, a stone's throw from Sister Faustina's convent. Jutberetem, that's, that's an expression you may learn and use as you go to Poland, because obviously you want to visit this city of king, kings at least, right? Krakow, so 
I'm giving you an opportunity to practice Polish language. You're welcome. During uh, his time in the factory that was only rzut beretem from the convent, he would stop very often at the convent's chapel to pray, either on his way to work or back, going back home. He didn't know a thing about Sister Faustina and the message at that time. But slowly, during his visit there, he started hearing here and there that there was this sister here and she received this very special message. She had this very unusual life, actually seeing God and talking to him. It was happening gradually. Um, but it was not in the convent chapel that he heard about Faustina for the first time. So far we know, the first person ever to, tell, to tell Carol about Sister Faustina and her message was his college friend, Andrzej Deskur, who, just like Carol, studied at the Jagiellonian University at that time. And, and he, from I don't know where, he found out about Faustina and the, about the message, and he was so excited that he shared it with young friend, with his young friend, Carol. And the story of their friendship, it's, it's a topic, it's an um, inspiration for another talk, seriously. It's just, just beautiful and amazing to see how God uses friendships we have, sometimes friendships which last the whole life through, which was the case of Carol and Andre, to fulfill our life's mission. This friendship, they started in a very normal way, just simply studying at the same college, turned out to be very instrumental in their life's mission. They met in Krakow in young age, and then both of them, some years later, became priests, bishops, and cardinals at some point. One of them became the Pope. And they cooperated in the mission of mercy throughout their lives. But at that stage of their friendship, they just exchanged the first excitement of, have you ever heard about this sister who received a special mission from Jesus himself? God is amazing in putting people at our life path, and it's all for a reason. Usually we don't see the reason. Where is it heading to at the time when it is happening? It is simply fascinating. Okay, let's go back to the storyline. In 1946, one year after the war ended, Carol was ordained a priest. He continued his visits to the sisters' chapel in Krakow, and already at that point in his early priesthood, whenever he gave a homily, it was noticed that he had a special gift for understanding the mystery of God's mercy, a special draw to it. He would speak about it like no one else in his times. Mind you, in our times, we think, oh, mercy is like everybody speaks about mercy. And you probably heard many good talks about it. And you can name quite a few good priests who have a good insight into that mystery. But at the time of young priest Karol Wojtyła, it wasn't so. The topic of mercy was really not there or not on the table. But he would have already then, in his young years of priesthood, a deep understanding and a, and a profound draw to this mystery. The message of divine mercy started spreading in the times of the Second World War, mainly through small copies of the divine mercy image with the chaplet of the divine mercy on the other side. They are very popular even in our times, the prayer cards, 
the Weimarcy image, one side, the chaplet of the Weimarcy, the other side, were, well, they were distributed already in the times of the Second World War. And miracles were happening already then, even though people, they didn't know the whole story behind it. They didn't know, oh, this image, it's, it's really based on true appearance of Jesus. It's not just a painter's fantasy, but this is really how someone saw him, and he requested the image. At that stage, people didn't know it, but they saw this image of divine mercy with this inscription, Jesus, I trust in you. And if they embraced it with faith, with trust, miracles were happening already then. I could name many, but I will just share one briefly with you. Um, there's a story of a soldier who carried the Divine Mercy prayer card in his chest pocket, you know, in his uniform, soldier's uniform, and a bullet hit him right there, straight in the heart, and simply bounced off the prayer card. A piece of paper stopped a bullet. Simply mind-blowing. Going back to Carol's storyline, in 1958, he became a bishop. He was only 38 years old. That's something. I don't know if we have a bishop young, young like that now. Um, he was assigned auxiliary bishop of Krakow. And that was the time when he was growing in understanding uh, of this marvelous gifts of God the gift of his mercy. And he was growing in understanding this very particular timeliness of the message of, of mercy for our times. And then, totally unexpectedly, in 1959, something very painful happened. The Vatican put a ban on the devotion to divine mercy in the form proposed by Sister Faustina. An official document called the notification was issued by the Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office. Well, that sounds serious, and it was serious. This ban forbade the distribution and promotion of the images of the Divine Mercy and the writings of Sister Faustina. How to understand this? Well, her message simply won people's hearts before it was thoroughly checked, before it was tested by the magisterium of the church. So there were some bishops who were uneasy about it, particularly because some translations of her writings had been done very poorly and misrepresented what she had written. These inaccuracies due to poor translation worried some in the Vatican too, so they banned the devotion. Very, very painful to those who already believed it, who already followed it wholeheartedly. And suddenly they started seeing their priests, their pastors, taking the divine mercy images of the church's walls, of the altars. Like, that was so painful. And at that very time, Karol Wojtyła was starting his mission as the Bishop of Krakow, the city which was primarily entrusted with the legacy of Sister Faustina, who died there, whose remains were and still are in Krakow, whose manuscript of the diary was and still is there. And so, what would Bishop Wojtyła, Bishop of Krakow, Krakow supposed to do with the case of Sister Faustina in those difficult times of notification? What would you do? Well, the prudent, the safe option would be just don't touch it, leave it, just wait. It can only cause you troubles, it can only create enemies that would be the safe option. 
But Karol Wojtyła, as we know him, wasn't one to choose safe options. And we love him for it. He felt deeply that Sister Faustina's revelations are true. And that the message of divine mercy is deeply needed in our times. So he started moving forward with it. Bishop Wojtyła knew he was treading on thin ice here. He needed much wisdom. He prayed a lot. He researched all the reasons behind the, behind the notification, behind the ban, and with the help of his college friend, Andrzej Deskur, at that time, Andrzej was already a noble bishop working in the Vatican, speaking of divine providence, of God's plan. So, Karol Wojtyła is in Kraków, and Andrzej Deskur is in Vatican. Karol is in the place entrusted with the divine mercy message, and Andrzej Deskur is in the place where the, the decision is to be made, the, what to do with, with the divine mercy message. The Vatican will give green light or red light. The Vatican will give permission or no. So these two friends are in those two strategic places for the Divine Mercy message at that time. And through them and through their friendship, God continues the story of preparing the message to be revealed to the whole world and, uh, and trust given to the whole world uh, at the proper time, at the right time, not yet. First, time of purification, and then time of flourishing. So, as these two friends talk and, and uh, make the discernment of what to do, what would be the best, how to help to lift the ban, they decided that best would be to pursue Faustina's beatification that would be most helpful for the whole message. And so Bishop Karol Wojtyła started the process of Faustina's beatification in the diocese. I want to emphasize here my great admiration for him, how courageous he was to speak to very important, very influential priests, bishops, cardinals um, about Faustina, about the Divine Mercy message in that time when Faustina, you know, to be associ associated with Faustina at that time uh, could mean that you will be called a, a lunatic too, because she was called a lunatic, a crazy person. That could destroy his whole ecclesial career. But he didn't care. He cared about what... God's will is, to fulfill God's will, that's what I care about, to please the Lord, that's what I care about, not to please the people, not what they will think about me, whether they will give me the crown or not, I don't care, I care about pleasing the Lord. And so that, that made him fearless, that made him powerful. And that also gained him respect in humans' eyes but he was not searching for it. Through the efforts of few good people, but especially Karol Wojtyła, the ban was finally lif lifted in 1978, after 19 years. And the message of mercy was able to spread and the church really started strongly encouraging people to follow that message. Six months after the ban was lifted, the brave cardinal from Krakow was elected Pope John Paul II. Wow, that's amazing, don't you think? He said once, right from the beginning of my ministry in St. Peter's See in Rome, 
I considered this message of divine mercy my special task. Throughout his pontificate, John Paul II would speak a lot about God's mercy. Until today, I keep on quoting him, not because there are no other people speaking about divine mercy, but he simply, his words are pearls. They are really uh, so profound. So I base my uh, talks basically on him and Faustina all the time. Maybe one day I will just spend the time of the next talk just reading John Paul II, what he said about divine mercy, and that would be a, an amazing talk, seriously. Second, the second encyclical that our beloved Pope wrote is entitled Divasi Misericordia, Rich in Mercy. And that's the first document, official document of the church entirely devoted to the mystery of God's mercy. Can you imagine throughout the whole 2000 years of Christianity, never church spent, put so much attention into the, to the mystery of God's mercy. John Paul's encyclical is the first document focused on it. Later, uh, John Paul II beatified Faustina, canonized her, and declared her the first saint of the new millennium in 2000. And during that solemn ceremony of Faustina's canonization, he also declared that the second Sunday of Easter was to be known as the Divine Mercy Sunday and celebrated as, as such in the whole universal church. It was such an important moment. Jesus requested that feast like 70 years before. In 1931, it was the first time when he spoke about his desire of the Divine Mercy Sunday. And finally, in 2000, John Paul was able to fulfill Jesus' wish and officially, as the head of the church, to institute this great feast filled with amazing graces for every person who receives it with trust. And on that day, actually, we know from private sources that John Paul II said, this is the happiest day of my life. Well, of course, I mean, I hope it's, it is, of course, for you. Because when we fulfill God's will, this is, when we are the happiest ever. And if John Paul felt that divine mercy is like a special task entrusted to him by God, then of course he was the happiest man ever when he knew he fulfilled Jesus' desire of the institution of the Divine Mercy Sunday in the whole universal church. Also during Faustina's canonization, he simply passed on the message of mercy to the new millennium. That was the beginning of this very important time of spreading the message throughout the world. And two years later, during his last pilgrimage to Poland, when visiting the Shrine of Divine Mercy in Kraków, which I hope you will visit too at some point, he said, today in this shrine, I wish solemnly to entrust the world to divine mercy. I do so with the burning desire that the message of God's merciful love proclaimed here through St. Faustina may be made known to all peoples of the earth and fill their hearts with hope. I do so with burning desire I can only imagine his eyes, you know, these eyes of old men, but they were really on fire for God. You could see his body deteriorating. He was really getting older and the disease was consuming his body, but not his spirit. 
His eyes, the reflection of his soul, were on fire for God. I wish solemnly to entrust the world to the divine mercy. I do so with the burning desire that the message of God's merciful love may be made known to all the peoples of the, of the earth. Not only to Catholics, but to all. Because all need hope. Everyone needs merciful God. Now, to make long story short, because the topic of John Paul II and the Divine Mercy message is really big, but I'm just trying to give you an essence here. Um, John Paul II dies three years after his last pilgrimage to Poland after the act of entrustment of the world to the Divine Mercy. And he dies on the vigil of the Divine Mercy Sunday. Six years later, he is beatified. Then next three years and he is canonized. Both events happen on Divine Mercy Sunday. Saint Faustina and Saint John Paul II, two great apostles of the message of divine mercy. People who attentively listened to God's voice, to God's calling, fulfilling their life's mission, having their irreplaceable share in God's great story of salvation. If you are listening to this talk right now, I want to invite you to ask God to help you to see your life story as an indispensable part of this great masterpiece, of this great mosaic of the story of salvation that God is creating through the history of mankind. I want, you to, I want to encourage you to ask God to help you to see the importance of your life in that great story of his. Maybe you will not see clearly yet your life's mission, and it's okay. But just ask him to give you as much light as needed to make the next good step on the path of fulfilling your life's mission. Here I am, Lord. I want to do your will. I want to have my share in your great, amazing story of salvation of the whole world. I am yours. Show me what to do. <laughs>